Hello and welcome to Game Master Studio, where we'll be talking tabletop role-playing games, tips and tricks that you can use to help bring your game at home up to the next level. Today we're going to be talking about the rule of cool and how it can enhance your game. Thank you for joining us in the studio. My name is Jerry, aka Frieden. And I'm Jared, aka DMF. And today we are talking rule of cool, how to inject epic and over-the-top action into your game to enhance your game, help uh, spice it up a bit if it might be lagging. Now, before we start, we do want to give a little bit of a caution that though this is a good way to boost a game and kind of a, a, in some ways, a cheap trick, it's also something that shouldn't be relied on. If your game's not interesting, then you need to work on making your game interesting. This will help spice it up. It can help inject a little bit of liveliness, but it's not going to sustain it forever. It's not something that you can run a campaign on unless you're really working at it and you have a bunch of players that are working with you on it's not something that's going to save a campaign that's dying it's just something that's going to give a little spice and boost and maybe some cool stories um this actually started from a, i was playing a video game and as i'm playing the final level i have to go rescue some people and i hop in the motor in the speedboat to go across to the island to rescue them and the music starts kicking in and the jets start flying overhead, launching missiles and shootings and speedboating across the waves, and firing the gun. And it's just like, this is so far ridiculous over the top that it was a lot of fun, especially compared to the rest of the game, just because I really felt like the hero. I really felt like we're getting into it. And now I'm going to go be awesome because this is the final confrontation and I have all the skills I need to fight the boss I've been waiting to take down. This is the kind of sensation that you want to give your player. Uh, your players are the stars of your show, as Jared is prone to saying over and over again, because it's true and it is important. And this is a way to make them feel like the epic action heroes. Yeah, uh, I've said it a couple times. <laughs> uh, it's an important thing to remember, I think, uh, except for some DMs more than others. And, I understand that not all games work that way, but it's some of them are a little bit more DM versus player. But as I've also stated, I'm not a fan of that particular style, but to each their own. If it works for the whole group, then that's fine. Uh, but yeah, you know, remembering you know, the rule of cool or making it epic, uh, that's it's a good thing to keep in the back of your mind to help emphasize making your heroes, you know, or making your PCs the hero of the story to, to like, if you, again, you don't rely on it, but you use it to pick your spots and you can take a cool moment and make it amazing. And since the players are your stars, one of the ways that you can really work to make things epic is playing to the PC's strength. Right. Yeah. You know, you, if you have a barbarian, give them some big strong guy stuff to do. If the wizard wants to blast a fireball at the enemy army, talk about, you know, this platoon flying apart and, like, it just explodes and sends people everywhere. Give them that that epic result to their action and you know, play into their strengths. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the tricks to uh, the fact that you can't just rely on the rule of cool for, like, a, an extra, a successful campaign, you know, because you need there needs to be some planning. And I, I personally think that mo a lot of the rule of cool is in-the-moment stuff. You know, a PC or a player decides, hey, I'm going to do this with the character... And then you decide to play it up and, you know, and emphasize what's going on. And instead of like, maybe you don't make them roll or maybe you make them roll, but they don't need to you know, much of a, you know, a, a success. And you're just like, you know what? You got this. You beat the crap out of the guy. You know, you beat the crap out of the whole room of worth of people with just one roll. You know, it's awesome. It's amazing. You know, there's a pile of, you know, of corpses over here or a pile of, you know, unconscious bodies. And you just, you know, you talk it up and you make it sound awesome. But again, if you are putting the work in and planning it to play to the strengths of the PCs, then you're setting up those moments. Like you might not have exactly in your mind how you're going to describe something, but you have an idea. Like I've set them up to win. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of setting them up to fail, you're setting them up to win. Okay. I have a blaster wizard that likes to throw off a lot of fireballs. What if I have, you know, this giant army of kobolds that think that they're being clever by bringing a bunch of barrels of flammable oil to the, you know, to the confrontation. We're going to, we're going to douse, you know, we're going to roll all these barrels down the hill and we're going to shoot flaming arrows at them. And they're like, Oh my God, the fire, the wizard just fireballed the kobolds. And then there's a new giant <laughs> epic explosion. I don't even think you need to get that intricate. If 
wizard likes to fireball everything. Just a tight Mac pack or a tightly packed mass of enemies is enough. They don't need to, to have the the flammable oil. You know that that almost seems like a little bit of overkill. But when it comes to epic, comes to the rule of kill or the rule of cool. Is there really such a thing as overkill? No. You know you can have these wonderful and wild over the top scenes. It can also be a little more subtle. Um, I remember one of the games that we were in. You had a situation where we walked into this bar and there was a bar brawl going on and the monk wanted to jump into the fight mm-hmm. and obviously they're all fighting unarmed and the monk's an unarmed master and just didn't really have to roll but just wiped the floor with all these chumpos yep. because it was really just right up his alley and the player was like yeah that was awesome that was cool yeah he didn't roll anything but he had a uh, he had an extremely fun time just beating the crap out of this vill- you know like basically this bunch of villagers just kind of in a bar brawl and he got to jump in the middle of it and have a time. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, in my opinion, in that particular situation, no real role necessary. You could say that, you know, there's a big combat, there's a big melee. Yeah. Maybe they're only doing one point of damage per, you know, fifth edition rules, but why, you know what I mean? Like, you know, was it necessary? All it would have done is slowed down the game. I, you know, I could have slowed down the game and turned that into an ex- really extremely long, gr- uh, grueling combat. Then at the end, no one really would have enjoyed but this, it was all about the storyline and the fluff. So I made it about that, and everyone had a you know a heck of a time. And real, even the people that didn't weren't participating thought it was you know hilarious. And instead of having an hour, hour and a half combat that really only one player is participating in, yeah. you give three, four minutes of of exposition, explain how it's going, and now we're at the same end that we would have gotten to, except without an hour of dice rolling. Right, and it helps keep energy up. Helps keep it keeps the game from grinding to a halt um, because combat, unfortunately has a tendency to do that. Yeah. I mean, we've mentioned it a couple times, you know, but combat is what should be one of the most exciting parts of a game in theory. Like if you're watching a movie of your story, most of the combat would be some really intense parts. There'd be the cool epic, you know, background music that, that fades in, you know, the sound effects would, you know, or like, you know, sound would kind of fade down clanging of swords and, and shields would, you know, the sound effects would kind of you know, fade up. And there'd be some cool epic moments and, you know, cut together and it would be, you know, three minutes of, of film time, you know, or screen time. And we'd move on with our lives. But at the table, that three minutes of film time is, you know, an hour to three hours of grueling dice rolling. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's what some people like. But you can take those those long combats, shorten them up, make your players feel, feel awesome if it fits them. Uh, similarly, you could have you know, a bar deciphering puzzles or performing to an audience. You could have the fighter school the garrison on how they should be setting up their defenses. Mm-hmm. You can have the wizard doing all sorts of arcane research and study and really just playing into their strengths to make players feel good about, I feel I feel justified in taking that feat or in putting those extra points into intelligence. Right, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't still have some, like, some skill roles or maybe even some combat roles here and there, but sparingly and with like low required success roles like maybe instead of okay normally well if they want to do this cool awesome epic thing then they're going to need like a 25 success no 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 it's right up their alley it doesn't really bother the game whether they succeed or fail or how well they succeed let them succeed okay that you know a 10 succeeds a 15 means they're amazing at it let them you know they roll a, a 17 boom they rock the crap out of it let them have their moment let them describe to you how awesome they are and then you just roll with the punches and just start, okay, you rocked out, you know, a friggin' uh, Steve Vai epic level, you know, uh, guitar solo. Well, as you're hitting the last note, fireworks go off in the background. Like, they <laughs> described to me Steve Vai level guitar solo. I throw in fireworks. Boom. Let's add a little, you know, a uh, little uh, glaze on top of the donut. So what you can do is turn those rolls into a no-fail roll. And instead, the skill check isn't to see whether or not you succeed but to see how good of a job you do at it. So yeah. even if they tank the role, it's like, oh, well, you still succeeded. And then if they do awesome, they get to describe how awesome they are. Or if you have players who aren't as creative, you can describe how awesome they are for you. Very few people are going to turn down the chance for you to tell them how great they are. Right, that's true. Yeah, yeah I think that, you know, no-fail roles is a good way to go, especially in situations, again, where, like, my character was built to be a social butterfly, I have, you know, tons of points into it, you know, especially for like the bards and the rogues that get like expertise and stuff like that. Like, you know, 
I get double proficiency, plus I have a really high, you know, ability score for, you know, this particular skill. You know, if you're playing 5th edition, if you're playing previous editions, like, I just have a really high modifier. Okay, uh, this is not even that important of a social interaction, so you just, you just persuade them. Tell me what you want the, to, to, you know, them to think. And especially if this comes up where it's something like, the DC is going to be 10. Well, even if I roll a 1, I still have 12. Right. Uh, because remember... Fifth edition ones are not automatic failures on skill checks. I don't remember an edition where they are. There's so. a lot of people that like to house rule that, and a lot of people seem to think of it as gospel that yeah. that a one is always a failure and a twenty is always a success. Where yeah. really it depends on the difficulty. And for skill checks, it's just a one or a twenty is a one or a twenty. Yeah, it's a big pet peeve. I don't like that at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you have a case where they literally cannot fail no matter what they roll then that's a great time to just let them go off because they're likely going to roll higher than a one. Yeah. So you can make your players feel awesome and feel justified with what they did. Uh, some of the other tricks for, for like epic tricks, cool tricks to spice some life into your game. Uh, stunting. I believe the actual term may have been borrowed from Exalted which was big on stunts. Yeah, you did stunts and Exalted, yep. And um, Feng Shui is another gaming system I know that has bonuses for people going like wild and over the top. Um, stunting is letting your players do stuff that's insane and epic and, and wild and then actually rewarding them for getting into the description and for doing stuff that's visually, describing something that's visually interesting or something... You know, a little more than just like, oh, we're in a fight. Well, I swing at them. Yeah, that was one of the things that I really like. I really enjoyed about uh, Exalted, especially compared to Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 at the time when I was playing Exalted. Is the fact that in 3.5, especially with all the people that I was playing with at the time, you know, anyone that I, you know, and I was in a game and they were DMing, which kind of conditioned me to if I was DMing, you know, in, in you know, in turn, if you wanted to do something crazy awesome or over the top, then you had to roll probably a lot of different different skill or a lot of different different a lot of different skill checks yep. with high success, you know, required, you know, DCs. Oh, oh, well, you want a tightrope to, you know, you want to do backflips on this tightrope? Well, I'm gonna need like a 25 acrobatics check or you know, or whatever, you know, you want them to roll. And then you go to Exalted and it's like, oh, you want to do something crazy awesome? You want to, like, I remember one of the, the stunts that I typically tell as a story. Like, I had a Nightcast uh, Solar, I believe, if I remember right. Yeah, I believe it was Nightcast Solar. Um, that was in the crow's nest on a ship that was about to go to ground. And as our ship was about to, uh, you know, go belly up, basically, on this shore, I jumped with the momentum of the ship. And instead of like crashing and dying, you know, in a tree or something like that, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to do like a triple axle, double somersault, you know, flip backwards, blah, 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 and land on one foot, you know, or the, the big toe of one foot on this large rock on the beach. That sounds cool here. Have some extra sun dice. I get extra dice for, you know, to, to roll towards successes. Like, yes, you still need a successes. They would set, you know, they would set whatever, you know, required many successes, you know, the equivalent of like a DC, but you would get bonus dice towards that. So that would be kind of the same thing like, okay, well, if you want to do a backflip on a tightrope, you know, you might need a 20, 25 acrobatic, but I'm giving you advantage on the roll. You know, the kind of like sort of the equivalent, you know, sort of, you know, how you would compare first, I'm talking first edition exalted compared to like fifth edition D and D or, Hey, do you just have a plus five to the roll or whatever you want to do? But still like that you're rewarding the player instead of punishing them. For like, I want to be cool. How dare you want to be cool? This game is grueling and painful and you're going to hate yourself for playing it. No, have fun, man. Enjoy it. I think another key component of stunts is giving agency to the player to do things. Um, I had an excellent example playing Feng Shui, which is based on Kung Fu action movies and such, where one of the, the players decided that, well, it'd be really cool to jump off one of the tables in the restaurant, grab the overhanging chandelier use that swing and use his momentum to drop kick one of the bad guys out through a plate glass window into the street and none of those like pieces of the set existed except for the fact that they were in a restaurant so because he wanted to do them he described them being there mm -hmm. and as a dm i'm not going to sit there and go no actually they don't have big windows for you to knock somebody through and they don't have anything hanging from the ceiling that you could swing from 
that just shuts them down and like, okay, well, I really don't want to do anything. Yeah. Where if you open it up and build it up and then they start doing, you know, then you get your players into a competition where they start trying to top each other. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's laughing and having fun and it becomes kind of a grand old time. Yeah. uh, There was a game that I ran that you were in with uh, our friend Chris, where like we were in the middle of an actual combat. And there was only like a few goblins left. And again, it was this actually the same monk that you made reference to before, uh, I believe, if I recall correctly, that he was playing. Yeah, it was Tordir. And they say there was three goblins, if I recall correctly, in a line like on this like cliff face that was about 10 feet up, give or take. And he's like, well, can I like jump off the cliff face to, you know, get some more height and like punch? I think he punched it like one of the goblins in the face. And knock him back into the other goblin, you know, and then, you know, like maybe get two for one. He, he was an elemental monk and he wanted to do an air blast and oh, knock one yeah. into the, yeah. down the line. That's what it was. Yeah. And he ended up rolling really well. And, you know, again, it was just a regular combat, you know, but he had this cool description in the combat. So not only like did he hit the one goblin into the other, but he, I, in my opinion, like he rolled so well and he did decent damage. That he, I had him knock that goblin, you know, f- you know, 10 feet back towards the other goblin, who then stumbled another five feet back into the goblin and behind that who then fell off the, the cliff. Yeah. The middle one fell off the cliff behind him, you know, fell on the other goblin. And then the last one, you know, I made him roll like a, I think it was like an acrobatics check to keep his balance and he failed. So he falls off the cliff. So all three of them fall off the other side of the cliff. I remember at least one of the goblins survived the fall and then was killed by another goblin falling on top. Of right. Him. Exactly. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the first one barely survived, but then the second one fell on him and killed him. And then the last one, I don't remember. I think he was already pretty beat up. Plus he's the one that got hit with the blast. So he died. So yeah, it was, it was just a fun little moment and just, and he's like, oh, wow, I got to do all that. That was awesome. Like I did, I was just expecting to hit one and maybe bump the other one, but which, which also came from an earlier fight where we were on the cliffs and afterwards I had said to him, like, you know, maybe you should have tried to use your, you know, your push and shovel them off the cliffs. He's just like, oh, I should have done that. Yeah. Like I got to remember that. And then like eight or nine sessions down the road, we run into these goblins and it's like, and he did that. I'm like, oh, he remembered. <laughs> Because you'll get players like you do the stunts and you like afterwards like, oh, I should have done this. I could have done that. Remember that stuff? Use it later on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with the epic stuff, ambiance yeah. is a big is a big part of it. You know, get get some music. If you're doing a fight scene, get some music on that gets their blood pumping. If you're doing a social thing, maybe like have like that that ballroom music in the background. If they're just doing that there, you can get some great stuff for like for like army fights or or sneaking around music is great there getting your players focused in the mood immersed uh we did a full episode on ambiance and envir- environmental cues so that's a good one to go check out if you want more information on that yeah i mean i think using music is a you know a really good one we talked about that in the immersion episode that we did a while back and again yeah it really gets people's mood pumped up and you know it there's a lot of kind of generic, you know, like kind of like classical pieces and, you know, that you can use for like kind of epic battles and stuff. But if you will know your your group really well, which typically it's a bunch of friends, and especially if you have all like tastes in music, then, you know, maybe like the best thing to do, like let's whip on some some metal so, or some Metallica or something like that and get your Iron blood Maiden pumping. Slayer. Yeah. You know, get some good, you know, some high energy, you know, music going for some big combats or, you know, then we whip out some, I don't know, some... Uh, 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 Alanis Moore set for some weird, like, sad pieces or something. Like, I don't know, so whip out some Enya or something, you know, like, you know, like whatever might work for your party just to, to set the right, the, the right, uh, again, the right ambi- you know, ambiance or the right mood for the, the scene. I used to use a lot of music in my games, uh, where we're doing Dark Hounds. I can't just use whatever music I want, unfortunately. Uh, so I don't play any music while we're playing, which is unfortunately, you know, in my opinion, is a is a loss for the, you know, in the moment. I do add music back in for, you know, for the viewers, but it's not quite the same because it's not adding to the the game itself. It's not adding to the feel for the, the players. Uh, one of the other tricks that we kind of already covered, but we still have it on the list is is saying yes. And in general, we're very much we'll say yes to your players. Don't don't shut them down. Don't say no even if you're going with the improv of yes and. But, you know, if somebody wants to try to, you know, drop kick the giant off the ledge, well, let him go for it. Yeah, try it. Roll it. You know, if you're really concerned about it, like, breaking your game or them them trying to do something that you think is totally out there, then, you know, still make them roll for it. 
I'm not saying make it impossible for them to get it. You know, if they roll really well, let, let it happen. Like, who cares? Well, I had this really big set piece with this giant. You're like, well, maybe you shouldn't have had the big set piece with the giant on the, on a cliff face. You knew they were going to try to knock them off the cliff. Yeah. You know, let them knock them off the cliff and then bring something else, you know, have something else happen. And not only that, the players get the awesome story of the time. They, they, there's this big fight with the giant. They didn't know they could do it, but then they realized that if we all pull together, we can knock him off the cliff and let gravity beat him for us. Go physics. Yay. Yeah, so there's a lot you can do there just by, like, don't shut down your players. Um, I believe it was in the second edition D&D campaign source book. They had an entire chapter entitled, Don't Say No, Just Determine Difficulty. Yeah. So you want to also be thinking if you want to do this stuff, uh, whether you want to do, like, epic set pieces as an occasional spices in your game, or if you want to try to run, like, a full-on epic campaign. Uh, one of the things to really be careful about when you're trying to do a campaign is it can be draining. Mm -hmm. You can have games start off and people are doing wild stuff and it's crazy and fun and everybody's having fun. And then after a couple hours of gaming, it becomes less of, you know, the wild twisting charge and swinging the battle axe. Just like, ah, uh, I rolled a 13. I guess that hits. I did five damage. Yeah. I would say the number one tip that I would give if I was going to try to go for the epic over the top, crazy balls of the wall campaign or even extended adventure or any, or any time they're like the purpose of this session is to just be insane and have a ton of fun. I mean, we all want to have fun, but you know, if, if again, you're trying to go for like, you know, this is just going to be like a whole session of rule of cool. Everything's going to be crazy over the top, you know, and just like, there's going to be nonstop, you know, hilarity and, you know, awesomeness. I would say play less more often. I would say go for shorter sit downs. Yeah. I would shoot for like the three to four hour mark and then just play as often as you can. You know, uh, you know, if you can still only get together once a month, fine, but it's going to be an amazing once a month game. If you can get together once a week, great. If you can get together more than that, awesome. But I think you're going to be better off shooting for a shorter sit down session. So everyone can keep their energy up the entire time they're at the table. And then every time they sit down at the table, they're going to be still pumped from the last time they played. And you can get through another three or four hours of awesomeness. And then they're going to be pumped from the last time they played and get through another three or four hours of awesomeness. If you go for eight hour marathon or sessions, you're just, like you said, by the end, it's just going to be like, I roll 15. Does that hit? Uh, I guess I'm going to try to ask the prince if he can help us with the thing. Like, yeah, I got a persuasion plus seven. So yeah, that's a 19. What do you, well, what do you say to him? I, I don't know. I just asked him for his help. Like, yeah, it's no. just going to be like, they're going to be low energy. I mean, you're going to have to be drinking I'm falling Red asleep Bulls. from you given the description. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to be drinking Red Bulls and five hour energy drinks, you know, that whole session just to try to keep your energy up. And even then you're just going to, you're going to still not going to be able to maintain. Yeah. Cause if, and then if you cut it early, people are like, oh, I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. And then they're going to be pumped for next time because they're not coming in and being like, oh, where were we? What were we doing? It was like, oh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, you want to leave them wanting more, you know, the same trick that they say, you know, when talking to uh, uh, when you're trying to uh, court somebody, leave them wanting more. Good tip for life. <laughs> um, and then we also we wanted to take a few minutes talking about the, the rule of cool and the rule of fun, which are basically, I think, comes down to in our general philosophy. Those are the two rules of game, the rule of cool and the rule of fun. You want to make sure that everybody's having a good time and you want to make sure that everybody feels like a hero or villain while they're playing. They feel like the star of the show and they're having a good time doing. It. Yeah. Those rules overlap a lot, but they're not mutually exclusive. So I think it's important to realize that they are two separate rules. There are going to be certain circumstances where the rule of fun might exist outside of the rule of cool. And they're going to, there will be a few situations. I can't really think of any, but there might be a situation where the rule of cool exists outside of the rule of fun. The rule of fun will typically encompass the rule of cool. But the rule of cool will not always be a part of the rule of fun, if that, well, if that makes sense. You could say that the rule of cool has to apply equally to players and NPCs. And then when the big villain gets their epic cool moment, the players might not consider that to be fun, at least in the moment. That's true. But then again, you all, that also sets you up to have, you know, this is the guy that the players are really looking to take down. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of like the contrast of, you know, you can't have light without darkness. You know, the darker the, the you know, the, the darker the darkness or the blacker the darkness, you know, the, the brighter the light. So that's definitely a, a good point, a value, very valid point. Uh, and that I, leads to one of 
one of the early tips that I read about GMing is when it comes to like boss fights is you look at the end of the fight to see how you really present it. Yeah. If it ends with the players are like, cool, this is over. Then you didn't do well. Yeah. If it ends with, aw, you got the last hit in. I wanted to kill him. You didn't do well. If it ends with, yeah, we got him. That's when you're looking yeah. at that's, getting the right. That, yeah. Mood that's that's the idea. The ideal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but we're all the rules basically come down to the, you know, you want them walking away, telling stories and excited to play again. You want them to go, Hey, you remember that time that this happened? Hey, you remember that time that Clovis beat the crap out of everyone or just walked away while we were pounding him in the back and nothing happened. Hey, you remember that time that, you know, I kicked, you know, I Kamehameha had one goblin into another goblin who then fell on another goblin and they all died falling off the cliff. You know, like those are just cool little stories. Little, you know, even if they're a five second story, there's, there's stories that are told, you know, you want to hear about, you know, you want a friend walking up to you on the street saying, Oh, Hey man, so-and-so told me about your D and D game last week. Sounds awesome. I, you know, I, I'd love to try sometime, you know, you want that kind of stuff. You don't want, Hey, so Jerry told me you're playing, you play D and D. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> you play D and D. Yeah. Let me tell you stories about the campaign that's going on. Yeah. And it's also going to take time to condition your players for this. Um, it, it, I joined a hack and slash style group once which was working well for them and i was talking about doing some of this more like epic over the top role playing type stuff and one of the players was just like oh so you mean like if i attack somebody like i rolled a 20 and then i rolled another 20 and i was <laughs> like no it's like if this guy was attacking the wizard and he was almost dead and you're up on the second level so you like jump over the balcony and come down like with your with your spear like drive it through and like pin him to the ground attacking him from behind because he didn't know you were up there. You know, that's the kind of cool stuff we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, most of the things that we talk about, you know, there's going to be a level of conditioning. We've mentioned that before. Um, you know, there's like this factoid or, or saying that I've heard where it takes like 21 days to change a habit. And that's assuming that you're trying, you know, actively during that 21 day period to change a habit. So I'm assuming that that would basically roughly translate to about 21 game sessions, which sounds like a lot. Yeah. I mean, that's like, damn near what a third of a year you know like a little more or a little yeah a little more than a third of a year assuming you're playing weekly but anyways it just it takes time to condition your players you have to be actively you know even yourself like if, the, if you want to start doing this stuff you yourself are going to have to take some time to to condition yourself and get you know get used to making it part of your your habit your your uh your programmed uh part of your game there are several things that i've been trying to incorporate into my game and where i only play i don't play as often as i'd like Every time I sit down at the table, I have to try to actively remember, like, wait, what were all the things that I wanted to start doing in this game? What are the things that I want to make sure that happen during certain parts of my game? I want to make sure that I do this during combat. I want to make sure that I do this during skill checks. I want to start incorporating these kind of things into my game. And then at the end of the game, you're like, crap, I didn't do half the stuff that I wanted to do. But, you know, you just keep working at it. And you also have to realize you'll help, you're going to have some players will take to it better than others. Um, those players who are more outgoing uh, more descriptive in their environments and talking and eager to jump in are going to take to it a lot faster than some of the reserved laid back players you definitely if you go back to our player types actors and storytellers are going to have a good time getting into that uh, like explorers and hack and slash and optimizers may not uh, instigators hopefully should get a good junk jump out of that. You know, it's just, it depends on the player types, how they come together, the personalities, it takes time to work with them, but you can see if you're working with the players, if you're conditioning them, if you're helping them develop, you're going to see that development, even in the character or the players rather, not the characters in the players that don't take to it as well. They're still going to see a shift in their play style. They're going to come a little bit more alive. They're going to be able to do, to do more of that stuff and feel more comfortable doing that the more that you work. So. Yep. So that was our thoughts on the rule of cool, which we feel is a very critical part to most games because it just helps people have fun. It helps them feel good about their characters. Definitely. If you have any comments on it, definitely give us uh, a drop us a line, hit us up and we'd love to hear about epic and over the top stuff. Your characters have done or stuff that you'd like to incorporate so that we can steal it to use in our own games. <laughs> Thank you for uh, listening. We'll see you next time we're in the studio.